five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Vapernor of the Week presented by Vape Mentors. I'm Norm Bauer, the founder of Vape Mentors and the author of the book, Vapernor. As the largest vape specific consultancy in the United States, we've worked with over 40 companies worldwide and have helped more vape shops than anyone else. The goal of this show, Vapernor of the Week, is to share the stories, experiences, and lessons of those people to help you learn from others. Since 2013, we've been preaching and teaching collaboration, cooperation, and partnering. And if we plan to be around, we must change our mindset. This show may help you to do that. So with that boilerplate introduction here to kind of give us a little bit of an overview, today's guest is someone who's a little bit different. I mean, everyone's different, of course, but it's a little bit different than a lot of people that we call vaporers in the vaping industry because his background is very unique. David, I'm getting, I'm getting some background noise. Um, it's, it sounds like something's rustling around. Is there anything rustling around over in your particular computer area? No, sir. I'm in the quiet room. Nobody okay. here. Awesome. All right. So maybe it's just something interfering. So tell us a little bit about who David Gerlitz is, uh, who you were. <laughs> Obviously, we're all someone that we've been in our different lives, but you know, your, your name might not be familiar, but your face may be familiar with people who um, watch television and may, maybe know about you. Well, um, yeah, I am unique, uh, as most people know. My wife will tell you that. My kids will tell you that. Um, the one good thing about me is that I'm at a point in my life where I'm above the opinions that other people have of me, so I can share anything and everything that I did in the last 40 years of my life. Um, back in 1981, I was hired uh, as the lead model for R.J. Reynolds' Winston campaign, the search and rescue, uh, depicting smoking to be macho, tough, rugged, robust, virile, flying helicopters, repelling off the side of the mountains, uh, doing all the wonderful things you could do if you smoked cigarettes. Um, obviously, the contradiction is there. You know, you find it very rare to see a smoker climbing 12,000 feet on top of a mountain. It generally doesn't happen. Uh, they were always trying to you know, sell um, tobacco. They weren't trying to sell uh, anything other than their product but they were associating it with healthy activity. That's what started the whole problem back in the 70s and 80s, always associating smoking with healthy activity. And all the ads, not just Winston, but also Newport, Alive with Pleasure, you know, You Come a Long Way Baby, you know, for Virginia Slims, Marlboro Campaign. But my campaign ran from 1981 to 1988. I was their lead guy. I had 42 different ads that were run on billboards and magazines, mostly men's magazines like Popular Mechanics, uh, Playboy, Penthouse, um, all the other issues that men would watch because we weren't targeting women. They had their own brands. You know, back then we had like 55 or 56 brands of tobacco. Uh, I was chosen to be the lead guy for RJ Reynolds. And um, to my credit, uh, I was associating with moving the sales from Winston from number four to number two behind wow. Marlboro and just a year and a half to two years, which is why I stayed on for as long as I did. Models generally last six months to a year. They do three or four campaigns and then they move on. Uh, but RJ Reynolds was using the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Sales are going up. So they kept me on from 81 to 87, 88. Uh, but we had enough stock footage that they could run the ads for another year or two. Um, that all happened really well for me financially, because they paid me well, you know, no one put a gun to my head uh, to sell this product. I was a model. I was an actor, you know, and uh, I don't know a lot of people that would turn down a hundred grand a year for 26 days work, you know, so plus it was a legal product. You know, the sad part about it was I came to the rev you know, revelation that they were targeting and marketing kids as early as 1988. My brother was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I was seeing a lot of my friends, even in the 30s and 40s, who were addicted to, you know, tobacco, you know, like I was from the time I was 13. So I, I didn't even have the epiphany that what I was doing was wrong, because in all justification to my career, if I didn't do it, somebody else would. It wasn't like I was smuggling cocaine or heroin. You know, I was selling legal products that was, you know, being marketed with $14 billion worth of annual marketing strategies and finances to get their product associated with healthy activity. That's when it all started until 88 when I decided I couldn't do the ads anymore, uh, which was kind of heroic and on my part because I didn't realize at the time that there would be so many pissed off people because I quit smoking publicly. You know, RJ, wow. Reynolds, RJ Reynolds didn't care for me anymore. They didn't call, they didn't do lunch with me, they didn't you know, ask my opinion or advice. Uh, I just had to quit because my kids were growing up 
They were of the new generation um, that was coming home from school saying, Dad, you're going to die. You know, you've got, if you smoke, you're going to die. You stink, you smell, because that's what was happening in the 80s with all of the public health and all the grant money that was coming in, not to mention all of the uh, exposés from the tobacco company and what they were actually doing. And that was exactly targeting and marketing kids. All right, so let's, so, let's, so let's take a time out because you covered a lot of territory there in just a few minutes, and I want to I want to dive down into a couple of different areas if that's all right. So, that's fine. Uh, so I'm going to assume and correct me if I'm wrong that you were a smoker before this. When you started the ads, you were a smoker. Yeah. I started smoking when I was 13. Okay. And, but I never smoked Winston. I always smoked Marlboro. <laughs> okay. And by the I, way, don't don't feel bad that you felt you were pandering to kids because if Fred Flintstone could do it and, and not have a conscience about it, then you certainly shouldn't have any any bad well, feelings. You know, I only did after after my brother died of cancer and okay. after all of the uh, revelations of four hundred thousand people dying from smoking related diseases. I you know I yeah. went through my my epiphanies yeah. and I went through yeah. my guilt, but you know I'm yeah. past it now because I spent yeah. the next twenty years trying to get kids to never start. So I did my redemption. I did my my uh, payback and pay it yeah. forward. So, yeah. you know, I don't feel that bad anymore. But at the time, at the time, when I was 13, when I started, no one put a gun to my head. No one made smokers start. You know, we did it because we were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, or whatever. We were going through the crappiest time of our life, you know, trying to find ourselves. We had issues. We had stress issues. We had body issues. We had, you know, image issues. We had uh, inability to play sports issues. We had um, relationship issues. So, Obviously, with a $14 billion marketing strategy to associate something that can make you feel macho, tough, rugged, yeah. robust, and yeah. real. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I was a smoker, and I did it for a long, long time until I was able to quit in November of 1988 uh, with many failures. Well, so, so, so let, let's, let's, re, let's take another look at history. And, of course, the people who are viewing this are going to be of all ages, from you know, 18 up to our ages. And so back in the 60s, back in the 50s, back in the 70s, cigarette smoking was not perceived the way it is now. In the 60s, it was advertised on commercials, on television. Uh, it was uh, in cartoons. It was on television shows. It was everywhere. You know, finally, uh, January 1st, of, I believe 1971 is when they finally terminated television advertising on, for cigarettes. But they still were able to continue doing it in print and, and other things like that. And then, of course, the tobacco companies started taking a little bit of a different posture. They started going after sporting events, and they started sponsoring, you know, the NHRA, uh, you know, uh, races and, and, and all kinds of different sports. But they were always going after the macho-ness. They were always kind of piggybacking on their, you know, a lot of cigarette smokers, as David says, they're very highly focused. And in the world of vaping, of course, we talk about focus and, and marketing all the time. Uh, you know, Winston and Marlboro were the macho brand. So you, you, you smoke a Marlboro or you smoke a Winston and suddenly you feel like you are, you know, a, a James Bond or some rodeo rider and what have you. So, right. so let's, get, let's get beyond that because this, this speaks to your, I'm going to call it your notoriety of the industry. You know, because people know you, you've been on the cover of Vape Magazine, which is the magazine that I write for. Uh, you've been interviewed by a lot of different people. I know you work with uh, Vaping Advocate and a lot of other magazines and what have you. So when you stopped smoking, you started feeling better. And at some point in time, you encountered the vaping industry. So let's kind of fast forward to that point of how you discovered vaping, where you discovered vaping, vaping, and, and what, why did it engage you? Because you put all that shit behind you. You were no right. longer pushing tobacco. You were no longer a smoker. But yet, did you just see an opportunity or just something that said, hey, this is a great way to help people stop smoking? Well, what's unique about me is that I did the ads till 88 when I quit smoking publicly. And quickly, I became the anti-tobacco activist for American cancer, American lung, American heart. I was the golden boy for the Center mm. for Disease Control. So mm. we 20 years in here now, Norm, from 1988 when I quit to, to about 2006, you know, I didn't even, vaping wasn't even around. So for right. the 18, 19 years, I became the golden boy for the media to also get into every school in the country to try to get kids to never start. And I was very well accepted. Grant money was coming in you know, in tons and tons of money because like California's Prop 99, 
you know, back in 89 and 90, for every pack of cigarettes sold, 25 cents went to cessation, prevention, intervention, education. So I was the most likely choice to get out there and tap me in front of 5 million kids over the next 10 years in a school assembly program to show how ridiculous my ads were depicting smoking to be a healthy activity. Plus, I quit smoking, so therefore my success was based on the fact that, yes, you can quit, but better idea, ideologically, never start. So if we could get a 14 to 18-year-old to never start smoking back in Uh-oh. Okay, I'm there. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, we're good. We just yeah. lost a second there. We're good. So, but back until, until the 90s, you know, I was the only golden – boy for them, along with the Lucky Strikes woman who did the Lucky, Lucky Strikes ad in the 50s and 60s, who had the laryngectomy. She had to talk through the tracheotomy. Oh, okay. Wayne McLaren, the Marlboro man who was dying of lung cancer, and Rick Bender, who was the uh, cause and effect guy who used to you know, dip tobacco, and he would use uh, chew tobacco, and he lost half of his tongue, his jaw, his chin. So the four of us would go around as like a circus as to what you don't want to smoke for. So we became wow. very, very uh, well received in schools because we were a quick fix to their grant money that they had to prove that if they write for a $50,000 grant in a school district, that they're going to do education on tobacco caused illnesses and prevention. So for many years, I was their golden guy and I was making lots of money. Well, not like I was as the Winston man, but enough to feed my family. And I was on the road 260 days a year in schools all over the world, including Australia, Japan, China, um, New Zealand, Sweden, as well as Canada and the U.S. So 17, 18, 19 years went along until I started realizing that uh, the anti-tobacco groups were as corrupt as the tobacco companies, including. Right, so, so, so let's talk about that, because a lot of people mistakenly believe that organizations like uh, the, Anti the Cancer Society, the Heart Association, what have you, uh, they, they are just as down on vaping as they are on tobacco. And if the logic says that shouldn't happen, the logic mm -hmm. says that these people should have some awareness of the fact that this is a way to get off of tobacco. So what is their agenda? Why are they so anti-vape? Are they being influenced? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're being influenced. You got Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, which is run by Matt Myers. You got the CDC, which was running <clears throat> originally by uh, Mitch Zeller before he took over the Tobacco Control Project. Then you have Cancer, Lung, and Heart, who get all their money for prevention and cessation and intervention and fundraising and volunteerism. Okay, They all became involved together with Big Tobacco as early as 1998 and 99, okay? uh, even before that. But when the master settlement agreement took over, they were all going to be guaranteed grants for per in perpetuity to now do their programs under the guise of public health. Okay, cancer, lung, and heart are the most profitable nonprofit organizations, of which spends about eight to nine percent of their volunteer dollars on research and trying to find cures. The rest is going to fundraising. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, Norm. I'm just telling you that this is a fact. Okay. Yeah. Look at the numbers if you take the time or anybody takes the time to look at their financials you'll see that no more than nine percent is going to research the rest is going to very high salaries the president of the american cancer and american lung make over a million and a half dollars a year okay um, you've got fundraisers galore every weekend there's a walk somewhere a relay or raised to raise money but there has never been a relay or a ribbon to wear for lung cancer you have right, so David, state. Right. David, let me, let me yeah. say, because you, you had mentioned the, the MSA, the Master Settlement Agreement, and for those people who haven't done any research on, we'll call it the history of tobacco, this is a very, very, very important document because this was an effort by the states to fund um, anti-tobacco and anti-smoking uh, uh, platforms. So why don't you share a little bit about the master settlement agreement that I think was back in, what year was it, like 98 or so? In 98, it all started and I was involved in it because you had um, Michael Moore, who was the attorney general for Mississippi. He said, I'm done with this shit. You know, we're paying out millions and millions of dollars every year in lost productivity and medical expenses caused by tobacco under Medicare. So he said in Mississippi in 1998, seven, late November, early 98, I'm going to sue the, the hell out of 
the big tobacco companies. And everybody thought he was crazy, you know, because no one had ever taken on the big tobacco companies before. But lo and behold, he got the right team of attorneys, including, including uh, Ness Motley Law Firm down in South Carolina, uh, Dickie Scruggs from an, another big lawyer down south. Four or five lawyers got together and they sued Big Tobacco and they settled for $12 billion. One I state. $12 billion. Dollars. That's a lot of money, guys. $12 billion. Well, then Florida got involved. They said, well, shoot, we want some of that. So they, they, they got, I think, 11 or $13 billion. Texas got involved. And then Minnesota got involved. So far, we're now up to $46 billion in just four states. Well, if you do the math, that leaves 46 remaining states plus five <laughs> territories in the District of Columbia. You do the math, that's $600 billion. So they sat down with Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, Matt Myers, Cancer Society, Lung and Heart, and said, we need to stop. We need to put a, a plug in this dike, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They came up with a number of $200 billion in addition to the already $46 billion, and they're going to pay that out in perpetuity to every state in the country and the territory. But the criteria was they had to sign off within 72 hours. The attorney generals had to sign off and say, yes, we'll take it, and but we'll never be able to sue Big Tobacco ever again for the life of tobacco. So that's how it all started back in 1998. And then, like you said, Norm, all the money was intended for, you know, cessation and intervention and education. And it was a bunch of shit because within one year, all the money was used for everything but education, prevention. They were using it for road repair, waterfront restoration, because it was free freaking money. Okay. Right, right. For the next 25 years, many states sold it in bonds, and now the bonds have come due, and they can't pay them back. That's why so, the state is raising the price of taxes on e-cigs. There you yeah. go. So, Bingo. So we're not going we're not going to go down this rabbit hole because obviously it's a very deep one. But he brought up the point that I wanted to make sure that we talked about. The states free spent this money. It's just like having a credit card. The states had basically billions of dollars there, and they went out and used it for anything and everything, not necessarily tobacco related. And so they were done in the form of bonds, and now they have to pay these bonds back, and now they don't have the money for it. So that is the big impetus, the big stimulation for the states to start taxing e cigs because the number of smokers have dropped. And so that means there's less cigarettes being sold. That's why the pack, the pack of cigarettes keeps going up and up and up and up. Exactly. So, so let's put that conversation aside because that was a really wonderful, you know, backstory about you, how you got involved with the anti-tobacco and what have you. So uh, tell us, tell us how you got into vaping, what you're doing in vaping, and what, what you plan on doing in vaping, and who you plan on doing it with. Okay. Well, obviously, it's hard to put 30 years in one hour. Okay. That's why. <laughs> That's why Aaron Biebert had me on camera for eight hours and he had to extrapolate so much because you, you get me started, Norm, and I don't stop because there is well, so well, much information. But well, I will try to remain focused. I promise you. Well, well, so here's actually, actually, we don't even have an hour because these are these are, forum, these are basically uh, video podcasts. So I try to keep them somewhere like 30 to 50, 30 to 30 that's minutes. Right. So that's within absolutely the, Within about the next 15 minutes, let's kind of condense. How you got into vaping, where you are, where you see it going, and we'll go from there. Okay. okay. See, my goal is to titillate a little bit. My goal Good. is to get people to think, okay? And if that's what I can do, that's my gift. Good. Um, Good. In 2006, I had pretty much had it with the anti-tobacco movement. They were trying to script me. They were trying to tell me what to say. And I gave, gave them a big fuck you. I, I, I said, I'm not going to do this. You know, you're not going to tell me what to do now because you're in cahoots with big tobacco and big pharmaceuticals. So I decided that I'm not going to do any more programs under their sponsorship. Okay. So I walked away. Um, 2007 comes along. Okay. And I'm unemployed. I'm not working anymore. I'm starting to hear about vaping and e-cigarettes. I'm hearing about this little cigarette type thing. And I started researching it because uh, I was interested in the concept. <clears throat> you know, if you have the hand to mouth experience, you get the yeah. nicotine yeah. level, you get yeah. whatever, you know, yeah. it, it seemed like a right thing to do because I knew Shantex wasn't working. I knew Nicotrol didn't work <laughs> right. and didn't work Habitrol. None of that crap was working. So I'm thinking, well, here's, here's it's like, this is, this is like a new concept and let's look into it. So I started doing my own research for a year and a half. And by 2008 and 2000 and early nine, I became the president of the TVECA. Ever hear of them? Yep. Ray Story and the TVECA. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, my story was so unique. He thought that I would be a good president for the TDECA to replace Matt Salmon, who was a congressman in Arizona or senator or whatever he was, because he was in charge of the ECA, which was the first trade group. OK, now I'm just giving you this detail because it's important. In 2008, that's when the lawsuits were starting to be filed and they were starting to, you know, um, collect all the uh, imports of the China uh, e-cigs and liquids, and they were starting to confiscate it and impound it. So Cetera and Enjoy, a big part of that, and Smoking Everywhere, decided to sue the FDA. And in 2009, okay, the FDA said, you will not be able to regulate tobacco under the FDA. Bam. That's when the shit hit the fan, and everybody said, I am now a vapor and I'm going to get into the business, and I'm going to make the liquids, and I'm going to come up with innovative mods and new second, third, fourth generation. So by 2007 to 2009, there was an immediate explosion by visionaries. Right. And I when you say visionaries, I mean people who like money. Okay. Right. right. That's opportunists. That's opportunists, which is fine. Entrepreneurial. It's That's not a bad not name. There's nothing wrong with opportunity. And it's it, it's it's like anger. If you if you address Anger at the wrong people, it's not a good thing. But if you address anger at the right people, it is a damn good thing. Well, right. by 2009, within a couple of weeks, I was no longer president of the TV ECA because I don't play well with others. I don't get along with other people's missions that are not mine. You, you and know, me both. My core mission is, was to get people to really transition from smoking to vaping. Okay, that was my goal. And I was seeing that that was not their core mission. They had other agendas. They had other issues. They wanted to sue, make a lot of money, sell out the big tobacco as early as 2009 and 10. When you started seeing, you know, Lorillard picking up the slack from Blue and taking over, buying them for $112 million or whatever. So it's a whole long story. And it's not, this is not the platform for my story. My story has to be told in many different venues if people are interested in listening. But I think for your uh, listeners, I just want people to know that this was a done deal a long time ago with Big Tobacco, Big Farm, and the anti-tobacco movement as early as 2009 and 10, okay? They then decided, because of my involvement and in knowing that this was such a miraculous alternative to smokers, because it was working, you know, we didn't need a government grant to quit smoking. We didn't need counseling. We didn't need Big Brother to tell us it's time because smokers want to quit anyway. So if you offer an affordable device, of course it should be regulated to know what you're putting in your body. You know, of course it should be, you know, understood that anything that's ingested, you know, should be checked out thoroughly and it should be done safely and it should be done with clinical, you know, labs that are clean and pure so where you get more or less particulates in it. So I started learning very quickly around 2011, 10, that this was something I really wanted to research. And at that same time, Norm, I was hit by a tractor trailer. I was put on, uh, in bed for about three years. I had four cervical oh, spine surgeries. So, but but it, was a, it was a blessing because it gave me four years to research Han Lick in China. It, it gave me you know, years to research the e-cig and the development of the second and third generation devices that were going to give you a better throat hit and all that other stuff that goes with vaping. So that was what I did for three years until 2010 and 11 when it started to really take off. And at that time, between you and me and everybody who's listening, I probably should have joined forces with Craig and Matt Weiss or you know, Miguel Martin from Logic, because I could have probably been a millionaire by now. Oh, but I yeah. decided that what I, was, but what I was going to do was I was going to become an advocate for trying to get the truth out about this alternative, which I really, really, really wanted to keep you know, viable, because I didn't want the FDA to regulate it as a medicine. I didn't want them to regulate it as a uh, cessation device. So within two to three years, we started to see the growth of the vaping industry from 2011 to 2014 explode, just like when you got in it, okay? Yep. You were doing something else prior to 2013, I would imagine, okay? Oh, yeah. But when you saw as an entrepreneur, as I would, you know, how can we get this information out in a form that people are going to buy? Because right now, as we know, we saw what happened with cancer, lung, heart, CDC, campaign, they decided that they were going to blindside everybody, throw every vaping manufacturer, every vaping entrepreneur, 
every vaping trade organization and consumer group, they were gonna throw them under the bus because of their failure in maintaining control and tobacco control because tobacco control was the biggest hoax between 1999 and 2005 or six before we started holding them accountable. At least I did. That's why nobody talks to me. That's why nobody in the industry talks to Dave Gerlitz because I'm like the big stinky pink elephant in the middle of the room. Nobody knows what to do with because I'm not politically sensitive. I call it like I see it. I call a senator out, a congressperson out, and I tell them that they're lying and they're wrong and they're now culpable and trying to ban a product that has been proven over and over again, which brings us to now. And what brings us to now is that they are still, in this country, trying to ban a product that has been proven scientifically time and time and time again, and they're not even bothering to look at the basis for the science. He froze for a second, can you hear me? That's what's making me feel, and that's what's making me feel like I need to be heard on a, a larger scale globally, not just in the U.S. All right, so let me ask a question or two. Um, so so far, the new FDA commissioner, Dr. Gottlieb, is more pro vaping than certainly uh, uh, Zellner was, and so all indications are he's not real happy with the deeming regulations and what have you. And I've talked to some people, and apparently there's going to be a big meeting coming up in Dallas with a lot of the. Uh, large groups, advocacy groups, and, and uh, political organizations, and and um, the the keynote speaker is going to be Duncan Hunter, which is going to be the first time a, a politician of that notoriety has been speaking at a vaping event. What's your what's your thoughts about the direction of the FDA and and Gottlieb? Do you think that they are continue to take this hard line approach, or do you think that they will maybe back off a little bit? I mean, what what are your thoughts, David? Well, my thoughts are since I know everybody. And I, yeah. I know Scott Gottlieb, and I know his past, and I know his involvement involvement financially with Cure, a vaping you know, um, affiliate. I, I know that he has he's an ally, but I also know that he has people that he has to report to and respond to. Okay, my hope and what I believe he can do is if it's done properly, that he will reduce the amount of levels of nicotine to. Well, you can't say that he's going to make it to levels that are non-addictive because it just doesn't happen that way, okay? Right. Because he's opening up a can of worms. I would like to see with the five-year extension that we got, which is really, to me, it's not a real win. All it does is just allows you know more corruption and allows more people to try to introduce products that are not you know oh, tested. Yeah. You know, it's going to introduce uh, new bottlers that aren't even going to sanitize the bottles before some 21-year-old goes in this basement and starts making liquid it and calling it premium. So we've been very lucky; no one's died that we know of. That's right. So at that point, that that's also uh, tongue-in-cheek, bitter, uh, bittersweet, because we know the safety awareness of what UK says about vaping, and it's 95% safer. The United College of you know, Royal College of Physicians and UK Public Health. And, and Britain and Scotland and Wales and public health is now recommending e-cigs as a cessation device. Our country is so far behind because we are imploding, okay? So I think what we need to do is I don't think we're ever going to have unity norm between Safada and CASA and the AVA and the VTA and the EVCA. I know there's always going to be haters and detractors because money and greed always seems to come up to the trough first, okay? Because greed always outweighs fear in my opinion. OK, and I believe that some of the people who are running our organizations need to get the hell out of the way and let some unified group come along and say, hey, this is what we need to do in unity under one voice, under one umbrella. Do I think it's going to happen? No. That's uh, a big. I, I tell you, I tell you, I would love to I would love to see that vision like you, because I've been preaching collaboration since the beginning. And with all this infighting, with all this ego, with all this greed, it all kinds of, uh, you know, is a problem. I'm part of a, I don't know if you know, but I'm, I'm the founder of an organization called the Vape Industry Business Exchange, which is designed to bring collaboration among the liquid companies and among the retail shops and what have you. We're not political, but we work with political. I know everything. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, good. I'm not, I'm not sitting here making buttons. I know who my heroes are. I know who my icons are. I know who to walk away from. I know who to stand side to side, shoulder to shoulder with. Okay. So I know pretty much, a lot of people don't know that. Okay. They just think I'm a bimbo because I just have, 
and you're I'm not. Pretty, you're just a pretty face, David. Hey, yo, oh, thank you. At 67. <laughs> you. you know what it is, Norm? And does, I'm being serious, but also I I'm, I'm like the prom queen that never gets asked to the dance, okay? Yeah. Yeah, because because I don't know if they're afraid of rejection or they're afraid that I'm going to embarrass them because I'm going to make them accountable for what they're yeah. doing and yeah. the screw up that they're making. We're screwing up big time here, Norm. Okay, that's why I am now spending a lot of time in Canada, which brings me to the end part of this thing. You were my new visions of what I want to do. But to I answer your that. question, I believe we have hope in the U.S. and I do believe that Gottlieb is going to do what he says he's going to do. We just got another extension now for, you know, the registration of September 30th has been extended and maybe extended again from what I heard this morning to the end of October. Now, which means that more and more people are going to come up with more crappy liquids, you know, to get their ingredients. And so we keep, we, we keep getting thrown under the bus, you know, yeah. and I've, I've been thrown under the bus so many times it doesn't even freaking hurt anymore. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I get up and I talk to people like you, and I lay low. I'm like a stealth. I'm waiting to see. But I've got to also make a living for my family. And yeah. at some point, and if, if somebody finds me to be, you know, ridiculous, like they want Aaron Biebert to let his movie go out for nothing and free the billion lives. And he took a lot of crap from people all over the uh, vaping community because he didn't put it out for free. You know, you got to live to eat. A girl's got to eat. OK, a family's got to eat. A guy's got to eat. You got to pay your bills. And when there's so many people that are making a lot of money, Norm, and people are accusing you of being that kind of a person, meaning me or you or or uh, Tony Abood from BTA or Greg Conley from AVA. You know, I think when we go to the bottom line is that we need money to make money, to change policy, to change public perception. And I want to change public perception by continuing to do what I do. OK. But unfortunately, the respect that I get in the United States is pretty much nil, okay? You know, I'll, I, they bring me out. I'm like a pole dancer at a convention. I'm like a stripper. They bring me in for the entertainment value because I was the Winston man. Big freaking deal, okay? I know stuff, and I know what's happening. And nobody in seven years, Norm, has even bothered to have a phone call or a think tank conversation with me outside of a convention where they talk, talk to me for 15, 20 minutes and say, oh, yeah, we need to get together with you. And then they never call. It's like porn. You know, you're excited for minutes and then it's over. You know, I'm like porn. You know, I, that's, that's, well, here's a promise. I'm, here's a promise I'm going to make to you because, uh, again, I'm sure I'm hearing more about you than I've ever known before because I have been one of those persons. I think you and I met in Chicago or we met uh, somewhere last year and we had a very brief conversation. And because we're of a similar mindset and a similar age and everything, we just kind of struck up a friendship. And then, right. since then, of course, uh, you know, I've seen the articles in, your ma in the magazine and what have you. So this is the first time that I've known as much about you as I have to my detriment. And I'm going to make, make, make that change. So let's plan on having you involved with some things that I can help you with and you can help me with. And when I say I me. I know you can, Norm. That's why I, I, I approached you in, in February or January at the TPE yes. in Las Vegas. And yes. I said, I want you to do my next story. Yes. Because you know, what I did in Bape Magazine was okay, but it was just, yes. a, it, was, it was only this much of who I am, okay? Yes. Yes. And I need to go full circle with somebody who can, who can be smarter than I am, because I'm not a good businessman. I'll tell you, I'll be the first to tell you. I need people to help me get the message out there in public relations that nobody in the United States is interested in doing with me, because I create such a stink that now they're going to have to be embarrassed by going to a Duncan Hunter or to a Dick Durbin or to Richard Blumenthal, or a Barbara Boxer, or a, a Henry Waxman, and hold them accountable for the lies and the fraudulent cherry picking that they're doing to now create bad laws by bad people. So these are, these are the things that I understand. I, I take it personally for a little bit, but now I'm, I'm beyond that. I need people like you and people who have a lot more intelligence about how to get the message out there because that's not who I am. That's not what I do. Well, but, but here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. And you and me will have a conversation personally. You know, the challenge is not getting the message out. The challenge is how do we make people want to hear it? You know, in the world of marketing, which is what I do, you know, you can have the best, you know, I can have the best device in the world right here. And I can tell everyone this is the best device in the world, but yet you get lost in the clutter. And so no matter what your, what your message is, whether it's a product or whether it's a message, whether it's a, you know, here's my backstory, here's why you have to be careful. The reality of it is, is that getting people to listen, getting people to want to listen, getting them to pay attention 
it's very challenging. And in this industry, we are bombarded by all these different organizations, by all this different contradictory and conflicting information. So I, I feel your pain, my friend. I feel your pain because, believe me, I feel it myself. I mean, as a strategist in the world of vaping, I talk about it with my partner all the time. It's like there's so many people out there that need so much stuff, but they don't necessarily know who to ask or they don't even know what questions to ask. And I have the answers, not because I'm fucking brilliant, because I never say I'm the sharpest tool in the shed, but I know a lot of very sharp tools. And like right. you, I mean, I think I'm a good businessman, but the best thing is that I know a lot of people who know a lot of things. Just okay. like so let's do this, David. We need we need to wrap this up, but um, sure. obviously this conversation has been very enlightening and on so many levels, been entertaining and enjoyable, you know, to the very very maximum. And uh, what is the next event that you are going to be at that I might see you at? Are you going to be in Dallas or in Chicago? Yeah, I'll be going to Dallas with the EVCA, uh, as far as I know, because I was supposed to go to Houston, then it got changed till uh, November fourth and fifth. So I'll probably go there. But I'm spending a lot of time in Canada now with Bill S five and what's happening up there. And I am coming up with a, uh, a new David G signature series of liquid that I have believed in. <laughs> okay, good for you. I have to, I hey, have to. A girl's gotta eat, a girl's gotta eat, dude. But you know what, and, and it's stuff that I've approved of and it's been clean, it's been tested, it's got all the yeah. criteria and regulations for certification. Yeah. Yeah. Plus I'm also, I'm not even gonna talk about my my anger with Von Earl, cause that's another story, but, but I have to do a, uh, I have to do an injunction against Von Earl so they stop using my picture, but that's all I'm going to say about that. But that's something else. But I am going to come up with a new starter device that's going to help 42 million smokers in America transition over with my name endorsed by me. And I think it could work. I think it's the kind of a hook that we need, you know, to get people who are on the fence and confused by all the fraudulent misinformation and lies by the media. So I'm going to continue to do what I do. You continue to do what you do, and together maybe we can find some some ideas that we can get the marketing out there to get people to want to hear the truth. No question. Well, listen, listen. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Don't hang up because we're going to talk after I sign off from here. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Again, it's been informative. It's been entertaining. You know, you got more information on a gentleman you may or may not have heard of and maybe you've seen around at different events. But, you know, listen to what he's telling you about. There's a lot of history here, and they say that if you don't study the past, you're doomed to repeat it. So learn from the past, learn from the people who have lived there and experienced it. And again, this is what this show is all about. It's about vapreneurs of the week or of the month or of the year who have really awesome stories to share. So, David, thank you, sir, very much. I'm going to go ahead and, and, uh, and say goodbye to everyone, and then we're going to talk in just a moment. All right. Hang on a second. Goodbye, everyone.